I'd like to welcome everyone to our event tonight. We're truly gratified to see you here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to, uh, my name is Ellen Dussard. I'm director of the Office of International Student and Scholar Services here at UB. And uh, I would, first of all, like to thank our sponsors for, for this evening's events. Uh, our sponsors include the UB Office of International Education, the UB School of Architecture and Planning, the UB Muslim Student Association, the UB Intercultural and Diversity Center, the UB Asian Studies Program, and many individual donors, including Drs. Kershid and Lubna Guru, Dr. Khalid Kazi, uh, Ismet Man Manun, and Professor Snikoff. Thank you to all of you for your generous support and for making th this event possible. Tonight we also uh, would invite you to make a do donation to Food for All. There are donation boxes in the back of the room. Food for All is a 501c3 charity and program of the Network of Religious Communities, which is an organization of multiple den denominations, congregations, and religious organizations in Western New York and the Niagara Peninsula of Southern Ontario. Its mission is to increase food security by educating the public about hunger and motivating food system change in Western New York. You are welcome to make a contribution on your way out. We'll be um, truly pleased if you do. Uh, this evening's event, Islam and Muslims in an Age of ISIS and Islamophobia, is the culminating event in our series titled Redefining the Narrative, Focus on Islam. Uh, this has been a series of public events hosted by UB faculty, students, and other groups this month. Our goal is to educate the campus community about Islam and engage in scholarly dialogue on issues facing Islam today. This series was designed in response to some of the rhetoric during the presidential campaign and also in our media. And it is intended as an opportunity to serve our student body and to address some questions that are increasingly being raised about Muslim communities. Many of our students at UB are Muslim, including both international and domestic students, and Muslims in the US, as well as, and including in Western New York, work as physicians, soldiers, engineers, architects, professors, and so on. There are even Muslims who are prominent in our popular culture, such as sports figures, such as Muhammad Ali. Muslim immigrants and entrepreneurs are also playing a key role in the rebirth of the city of Buffalo on the west side, for example. And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Dean Robert Shibley of the School of Architecture and Planning, who will introduce our speaker tonight. So this morning at breakfast uh, with my wife and partner, Linda Schneekloth, introduced just a moment ago. Uh, I said I have this opportunity to introduce our speaker tonight. And she showed me an op-ed column in the Buffalo News that I would have never read on my own. It's Clarence Page. She showed me an op-ed in the Buffalo News. The title of it was Trump, Trump 2.0. Don't bet on it. In, in his predictable headline, one could imagine where the essay might be going. But he surprised me when he quoted John McWhorton, a Columbia University professor in linguistics, who uh, was uh, essentially in his book, Losing the Race, Self-Sabotage in Black America. It gave me hope for the Buffalo News that we were quoting linguistics professors. <laughs> and uh, deep and renewed respect for Clarence in the way he interpreted the speech and rhetoric of Donald Trump and the challenges we face regarding it. So I'm just gonna give you a short headline. The essay spoke of how some folks self-identify as victims. 
the victimology or the the sort of self the, the, the sort of cult of victimology, if you will, leads to a kind of self segregation, and then an engagement of a kind of "don't bother me with the facts" anti intellectualism. I come to tonight grateful for a group of people who absolutely can define limits of tolerance and the role of rhetoric and how it can be confronted in what I take to be an extraordinarily positive and proactive conversation. I believe our speaker offers both an address to our limits of tolerance and a positive and proactive opportunity to the great issues facing Islam today. Within both, with both, gratitude for the depth and breadth of Islamic mysticism and grief about how it is challenged with some of the contemporary rhetoric, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Omid Safi. Professor Safi of Islamic Studies specializes in contemporary Islamic thought and Islamic spirituality. He is the chair of the Islamic Mysticism Group at the American Academy of Religion, the largest international organization devoted to the academic study of religion. Omid is an award-winning teacher and speaker, and this makes it Dean Glow, as has been nominated 10 times for Professor of the Year awards at Duke University, University of North Carolina, and Colgate University. He is a teacher. He's the editor of the volume Progressive Muslims on Justice, Gender, and Pluralism. In his groundbreaking volume, he inaugurated a new understanding of Islam, which is rooted in social justice, gender equity, and religious ethnic pluralism. His work, Politics of Knowledge in Pre-Modern Islam, dealing with the medieval Islamic history and politics was published in 2006. His memories of Muhammad in an award-winning biography of the Prophet Muhammad. His last volume on American Islam was just published by Cambridge University Press. It was a forthcoming volume uh, from Princeton University Press on the famed mystic Rumi. The Carnegie Foundation recognized Omid as a leading scholar of Islam in 2007-2008. Omid has been the most frequently sought speakers on Islam in popular media, appearing frequently in the New York Times, Newsweek, Washington Post, and then all the alphabets, PBS, NPR, NBC, BBC, CNN, and the international media. He regularly blogs on at On Being. He leads a summer program in Turkey, Illuminated Tours, which focuses on the spiritual dimension of Islam and the rich encounter of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism there. The program is open to everyone, and Omid invites the audience members to join him on that journey. The title of the talk, Islam and Muslims in an Age of ISIS and Islamophobia, will, I'm sure, give us a new rhetoric to consider the current dialogue that's occurring here in the United States and across the world. Omid, welcome and thank you for joining us. down south. Hello, y'all. Hey, y'all. <laughs> and as we say in my other neck of the woods, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. It is a great joy and privilege and honor to be with you. Uh, I am deeply touched to the core of my heart by all the work that has gone into organizing this. And I'm going to begin the way that I begin almost every single talk that I give, which is by thanking you. Uh, I want to thank you for the gift of your time, 
which is a recognition that actually comes right out of the depth of, of the Islamic mystical tradition uh, that gives shape and meaning to my own life. It is a reminder and an awareness that the moments in our life are actually finite, that the number of breaths that we get to take, thank you, uh, that we get to take are limited. And um, there's no power on earth or heaven that can add or subtract to them. So whenever you all make that bold and courageous decision to come and spend an hour of your life listening to a talk, that for me is an ethical responsibility to make sure that that time is not wasted and that we leave this conversation, inshallah, as we say, kinder, gentler, more determined, and more aware of the ways in which our lives are extraordinarily connected with one another. I'm going to begin with the picture of the three beautiful people that you have uh, on, on the screen above you, also with a reminder of how serious the moment in which we find ourselves is. Uh, this is not going to be a, one of those rah-rah speeches. Uh, this is not intended to assure you that we're going to make America great again. <laughs> Nor is it a response to that articulation with Secretary Clinton's rejoinder that, on the contrary, America has always been great. The point that I'm going to start out with is a reminder of that biblical and Quranic imperative, which states that you measure the moral health of any community by measuring the way in which the people who at the moment find themselves weakest and most vulnerable are faring. It is not about how much wealth, privilege, power, a particular society is generating, it's by taking a look at the way that the poor, the needy, the orphan, the widow, the stranger, the graduate student, um, people, I stole that joke from Simpsons, um, people who find themselves struggling, however they are faring, that actually tells you about how we stand with one another and in the sight of God. So I want to be very clear that even though the bulk of this particular conversation is going to be looking at the community that I am grounded in and many of you are grounded in, the American Muslim community, there is no pretense here that any of us have a monopoly on either truth, goodness, beauty, or, on the other hand, marginalization and persecution. It is rather a call to remember that at any given point, many of us find ourselves vulnerable. And it is actually by recognizing the urgency of linking together our suffering, our vulnerability, and striving for a notion of the common good that actually transcends any one of us. That there's the hope for the redemption of an American experiment which at the moment is not doing all that well. So you're going to hear in the course of our conversation references to the African American community, the Hispanic community, the gay and lesbian community, the folks who are undocumented, poor people, women's rights, the rights of the less than physically fully abled, the rights of people in the public education system. And this struggle is going to be, can we strive for some notion of the common good? I begin, though, with these beautiful three young people that you see on the screen. And if you're not familiar with them, these are Dia, Yasur, and Razan three beautiful students of mine who were brutally shot and killed in their own apartment in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. 
this is a family that I have known for 10 years. I know their parents. I've eaten at their breakfast table. I've, I've prayed with their parents. Um, and then after they were brutally shot and killed in their own apartment, I was asked to then stand in front of 10,000 students from my former university and assure them that they, and in particular the Muslim students among them, actually belong. The university, like all universities, was deeply concerned, yes, about the students, but also about protecting its own brand. And so less than 24 hours after the murder, before they had even spoken with a single family member, they released a statement saying, this was just a parking dispute. And there were those of us who had to stand up in our university, talking with our students, but also at the administration, and saying, we do not know that this was a parking dispute. In fact, every bone in our body tells us that if someone walks into an apartment, shoots and kills people, and on the way back outside the door, stops over their dead bodies again and shoots them in the head one last time, that this is not about whether your car was parked in my spot. That there is an anger, there is a bigotry here, which we are hearing more and more frequently in our country. So I want to make sure that we've acknowledged this and their lives and we're not going to turn away. They're not the first and they won't be the last. Many of our communities are confronted with this and the African American community has suffered so long that there's even been the need for a radical, bold, and beautiful movement with this simple demand, stop killing unarmed black people. The fact that in 2016, there would actually be a need for that goes to show you just how much work we have ahead of us. So the tone of this talk is going to be, if you want America to be great, no, Mr. Trump, it is not about making America great again as we were in the 40s and the 50s, because that America wasn't so great for women, for African American, for immigrants. And no, Secretary Clinton, America has not always been great, not if you're Native American, not if you're female, not if you're an Irish immigrant, a Jew, a Mexican, or now a Muslim. If greatness is going to be applied to America, it is in our future. What would it mean to actually have the audacity to say, we want to be great, but we've actually never been great for all of us? Greatness has been for some of us. But something that is applied to some of us isn't the same as believing that all of us are created equal. To strive for something to come. For that, I'm going to begin with a reminder of Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz, someone that might be more familiar to you as Malcolm X. Malcolm had the audacity to remind us that what we usually speak of as the American dream has more often been experienced by African Americans as the American nightmare. The famous, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. And if this sounds like the angry black Muslim speaking, let us also remember that towards the end of his life, Martin Luther King ends up in a very similar place. By 1967, he gives interviews in which he says, when I stood there and I talked about the dream that I had had, in retrospect, I think I might have been a little too naive. The 1967 Martin says, the truth of the matter is that the dream and the nightmare have been wrapped around each other. 
I want to begin the discussion of the life of Muslims in America with a reminder of African American history to remind us of something that we used to know and we have forgotten, which is that the African American community is the single largest group of American Muslims. Up until 1970, the single largest block, the majority of American Muslims were black, were indigenous black Muslims. That even when we take up, talk about and teach about the horrific history of transatlantic slavery, that 15 to 25 percent of all West African humans stolen and enslaved and brought to the Americas were people of Muslim background, systematically robbed and dispossessed of their culture, language, heritage, and religion. We want to freeze our discussion on the good side of the civil rights movement. Every single one of you, if you went through the American public school system, at some point you heard about the dream that Dr. King had had, when supposedly we began the process of becoming this post-racial society. Sarcasm part. <laughs> Fully engaged. A measure of how hard it is for us to have the conversation that we need to have is if we also ask ourselves how many of us have ever heard of or read or listened to Dr. King's Riverside Church speech. No shame, no shame, but just a show of hands. <laughs> Students of mine don't care. The fact that there are virtually no college-aged students who are familiar with King's Riverside Church speech tells you about the challenge that we as American Muslims and we as an American society face today. Here's what happens to Martin from 63 to 67. On April 4th, 1967, a reluctant and shaking Martin Luther King walks into Riverside Church, New York, introduced by Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, the most prophetic voice of Judaism in the 20th century. The person who says, worship of God is forbidden to us so long as we continue treating Negroes the way that they are treated in America. A Heschel that when he is asked by a reporter, Rabbi, why are you marching against the war in Vietnam? His answer is, because I cannot pray. Because every time I open up my prayer book, there I see the children of Vietnam burning. And that king stands in Riverside and he begins by saying, I have come to this magnificent house of worship because my conscience no longer permits me to remain silent. The time comes when silence is betrayal. And for us, with respect to Vietnam, that time is now. And he's a preacher and he's in the business of saving souls but the soul that he wants to save is the soul of America. And he says, I see America's soul dying. And I'm afraid that if we die and you do an autopsy, the answer is going to come back to war. That war killed America. And preachers love lists. So he says, I'll tell you what's killing us. It's this triplet giant of evil. Racism, as it has always been. What does the voice of Martin and Heschel have to tell us today when racism is still with us? The second one for him is materialism. We're supposed to be a society that puts the human being at the center. He says we fall in love with things. What does that Martin have to tell us where the top 1% of society owns 42% of the wealth? What, how are we doing as a people when 20% of our babies are living in poverty? 40% of 
of our black babies, 40% of our Hispanic babies, 40% of our Native American babies are living in poverty. The richest nation in the history of humanity and our own children are living in hunger. Something is wrong with us. Where is that voice? And the third one for Martin is militarism. Not just war. War is the symbol, is the outcome. Militarism, this disease of being obsessed and consumed with warfare. How was he received? Not so particularly well. The FBI calls Martin the most dangerous man in America. The New York Times talks about his error. The Washington Post calls him a demagogue and someone who has outlived his usefulness to his people. The United States government orders him to be under surveillance. Martin Luther King is shot and killed as a deeply unpopular person. 57% of all African Americans have rejected him. 72% of all Americans disagree with him. So if Martin Luther King, the closest thing we've had to black Jesus, is someone that the United States dismisses when he dares to make the connection between racism at home and warmongering abroad. We should not be under any delusion about what is waiting us. None of us have the cultural, the political, and the religious cachet that Martin did. To make the argument that we as a society are failing in terms of our racial makeup, we are failing in terms of the way that we're treating the poor, and we are failing in terms of having military camps on the soil of over 100 countries around the earth. This is not how you win the popularity contest, but it might be what we need to tell each other. We gotta love each other enough to tell each other the truth. And here's one of the strange truths about America, which is a beautiful truth. It is the very people, like Mammy Till over here, the mother of Emmett Till, whose 14-year-old son was killed in the South by a bunch of white terrorists, dragged him out of the bed, beat him so savagely, and put a bullet through his brain, all because, allegedly, he whistled at a white woman. It's the most despised, the most marginalized, who actually get to stand up and claim that mantle of moral authority. It's Mammy Till who says, I'm gonna bury my baby, but we're gonna have an open casket funeral so that the whole world can see what they did to my baby. She's the one who says, my heart is breaking, but I have no time to hate. I'm gonna dedicate myself to this life of love and justice. And a similar thing happened for our Muslim community. 15 years into 9-11, 15 years after thousands of petitions and announcements and press releases and advertisements from every single Muslim organization, Every time that there's a terrorist activity that happens, right? The Muslim organizations, as they should, they all release the same press statement. We hate and condemn this terrorist action. We offer our deepest, most heartfelt condolences. The actions of these vile terrorists do not represent the beautiful religions of Islam. You have our sympathies and our condolences. We've said this over and over and over again and it's not making a darn worth of difference. If you measure the way that we as a general population view Islam and Muslims, there is no religious community that today is viewed with more suspicion, more animosity, and more hatred than Muslims. 
we are 20 points worse off today than we were a week after 9-11. 72% of Americans openly say, we don't like that Muslims. Right? And you all know if 72% say that, right, what probably the people who are not going to out of politeness say it, what partially changed the story was the Muslim equivalent of the Mammy Tale story. This former student of mine, a five foot three dynamite woman, she was a bold, badass, brilliant, can I say badass? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, a brilliant, charismatic 18 year old who today is a bold, brilliant, beautiful, charismatic 28 year old. She's a physician. She works in inner city San Francisco, working with impoverished communities, largely HIV positive communities. And she's on call and her phone starts blowing up with condolence text messages from her friends. She gets on the plane, flies back to North Carolina. As she gets off the plane, she's still in her medical scrubs. There's a press conference waiting for her. And she stands there with her voice shaking and she says, you all have to excuse me because I'm spending every ounce of energy that I have just to hold myself together. But you see, I just found out about what happened to my brother, his wife, and his wife's sister. And I'm a doctor. I know when they tell me about the autopsy report how exactly they were killed. I'm falling apart, I am hurting, I'm in agony, but I'm also the love that my mama and my baba, who are standing behind her, put into my bones. I'm also the faith that I was raised with. It's because of that love and that faith that I can stand here spending everything I have just to talk to you. And for the first time, really since 9-11, people were able to see a Muslim as a human, as a human being who loves and yearns and mourns and misses and falls apart and holds themselves together. It shouldn't take that, but this is where we are. I've talked in the title about American Muslims between ISIS and Islamophobia, Quranically, we are given a mandate. Anytime you're going to do a critique, you have to begin with your own self. You begin with yourself, with your family, with your community. Right? I would love to begin with Trump. <laughs> I would love to just call him what I called him in print. This is, in fact, my most glorious moment in print, calling him an orange Oompa Loompa. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not going to start there. We have to start the critique with ourselves, right? Here's a reminder of what is happening. ISIS is engaging in a level of savagery and brutality that is unknown to most of us. You know ISIS is effed up when Al-Qaeda releases a, a press release saying, ISIS, you're messed up, <laughs> right? Al-Qaeda is like, fly planes into buildings, sure, but behead people on camera? Dude, you have issues. <laughs> right? What do you do about the fact that ISIS has to perpetually ratchet up the level of savagery in order to continue to get our attention? What do you do with the fact that about six weeks ago, they actually had a child behead his own mother, right? You don't have to be a professor of Islamic studies to know that when somebody went to the prophet and said, who should I be nice to? His answer was, your mama. And the guy was like, well, after, the, after my mother, who should I be nice to? He was like, again, your mother. And the guy was like, okay, after my mother, a third time, your mother. And then after that, your father, and then everybody else. 
right? What part of be nice to your mother, thou shalt not behead your mother, do we need to understand? What part of the ISIS prisoners, the few who have gotten out, say, I was held by ISIS for three months, I asked them for a copy of the Quran, and they told us we don't have one. What do you do when the few recruits that we've been able to identify who've left North America, the last thing that they order to take with them, and I swear to God I'm not making this up, is literally called the Complete Idiot's Guide to Islam. Because that's what you are, son. You are a complete idiot. They are not motivated by their deep knowledge of Islamic theology. They're appealing to people's sense of heroic adventure, travel lust. What do we do is for me to go back to that teaching that the prophetic tradition, and in particular Rabbi Heschel, has instructed us. Heschel always says, and it's a beautiful, powerful statement, few are guilty, all are responsible. You are guilty. ISIS is guilty. But all of us are responsible and accountable. All of us have to ask that question, what did we do to create the conditions in which ISIS flourished? There was no ISIS in Iraq before the American occupation of Iraq. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq before the American occupation of Iraq. ISIS is guilty. They own the atrocity and the blood that is on our hand, we also have to ask ourselves some of these hard questions. The answer that we get from Islamophobes is, ISIS is guilty, American Muslims are responsible. My own university canceled plans for Muslim university students to have the call to prayer go out from the chapel because a certain Mr. Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, said, Duke University Muslim students are responsible for ISIS. To which my students, because they're 18, said, oh, so sorry, Mr. Franklin, we forgot to text ISIS. ISIS, Duke, please stop beheading. You're really messing up my college life. <laughs> what, like, what do you want them to do? What do you want an 18-year-old kid in North Carolina to do to stop the atrocities of ISIS? What do we do about the fact that when scholars actually study the beheading videos of ISIS, you see that their cinematography is directly patterned after Hollywood horror films. These are people that have grown up watching movies like Saw, much more than they have actually reading classical books of Islamic theology and law. If they had, they would know that you're not allowed to mutilate bodies even your enemies. And I'm not a charts person, I'm a poetry person, but if you want a chart, okay, you got 1.6 billion people, and there, according to their estimate, is the number of ISIS. Some sense of proportionality. President Obama goes on TV and talks about it's time for the Muslim world to explicitly reject the ideology of Al-Qaeda and ISIL slash ISIS. Fair enough. Fair enough. Why is it that to this day New York Times pundits can go out and say things like Muslims have never denounced terrorism? And some of us, I don't know, one of us named Omid Safi is like, do New York Times person named Tom Friedman, I sent you, I hand delivered to your desk a box of Muslim denouncements of terrorism. So at some point, I just have to ask the question, is it that we've never denounced terrorism or is it that you prefer not to hear it? Our friend the Dean was so kind to rattle off the name of all the TV channels that I'm on. You notice Fox News is not on one of them. <laughs> uh, not an accident. 
because it's not a news channel. I grew up in Iran under state-owned propaganda. So when I see a propaganda channel, I know what it looks like. Right? That is fear-mongering. But here's the question that 15 years into 9-11, I finally allowed myself to get to. For the first 15 years, I would get these emails, hey, Omid, this is your friend, blah, from MSNBC, from Al Jazeera, from the New York Times. Crazy shit happened in the world. I need you to come on air. I need a press statement from you saying that you denounce this terrible action. You denounce this terrorism. For 15 years, I was like, oh, sure. I'll get on my laptop, and I'll type you the statement. No problem. Here's where I am in 2016. How dare you? How dare you assume that there's even the need for me to denounce the beheading of a fellow human being? How little do you think of my humanity and the humanity of my people? By what ground do you assume that there is an ounce of support for such a vile, even action in our hearts? That actually has nothing to do with the tradition that makes me who I am. It has everything to do with assumptions that you're making about my people. So I'm not going to go on TV to hate and denounce terrorism anymore. The question that I want to have is how are we all responsible and how can we create a better world? Why is it that ISIS does something and it's on every TV channel, but when the most important Muslim scholars, point by point, take apart the arguments of ISIS, it hardly registers on national media, even when the most important of the Muslim scholars do it? OK, I've done the ISIS part. Now let's get on with the orange and Loompa. <laughs> so look. Here's where we are as a nation. You wanted your circus show, you got your circus show. You're going to have Hillary versus Trump. Rejoice. The ratings will go through the roof. You could have had sanity. You chose the circus. But here's what I'm wondering about. It's not Trump the individual. I heard somebody told me there were 16,000 people in the Buffalo rally for Trump. There were 30,000 people in the North Carolina rally for Trump. It's not Trump the person that frightens me. It's the tens of thousands of people showing up and nodding and yelling in support in his rallies, because those are my neighbors. I live in that America. Any time that you and I say, I don't recognize what our country has become, we're actually avoiding the issue. This is us, the good and the beautiful and the hideously racist. This is us. The question that I want us to know is that when Trump is talking about banning Muslim immigrants or registering Muslims, where is the voice of the courageous journalist who is going to stand up and say, we've gone down that path once? where we register people based on their ethnicity. It was called 1930s Germany. We've learned some things from it. We don't want to go down that path again. It's not just Trump. It's also Cruz. It was also Ben Carson, who wants to run for the highest office in the land, but apparently has never even read the first page <laughs> of the US Constitution. I mean, I've been blessed. I've had amazing students who would read seven books for each class of mine. Seven, right? Much more, Much more than that. OK, I'm being kind to myself. <laughs> and look, you always know the student that hasn't cracked the book, because you ask them a question, and they start looking off into space. I really feel like I, mean, I don't care about your feelings. I ask you what is in the book. And if the first page of the book says, the government shall make no laws imposing religious requirements. If you don't know that, you don't get to run for the highest office in the land. If you don't know chemistry, you don't get to be a chemist. If you don't know what's in the first page of our founding documents, you don't get to run for presidency of the United States. And why are we not asking that question? 
why are we not asking the question about when he compares Syrian refugees to rabid dogs, where is our collective voice that says, we remember when people fleeing persecution were compared to animals, and it's when we compared Jews to mice. We have that memory, and we're going to hold you accountable. Every time they make these comments, of course, their pockets get richer. So let's talk about where are we and what has caused this. Is it the fact that people are scared? Sure. Many of us are scared. Fear is a real, primal, powerful motivation. We love our babies, and the thought of something happening to our loved ones terrifies us. You want to be scared? I tell you who exactly you have to be scared of. White people. Straight up. With some modification. The overwhelming majority of domestic acts of terrorism, of mass shootings, are committed. 18-year-old to late 20s, white males with an obsession with guns. That's the profile. But here's how we process it as a nation. When Dylan Roof walks into the historic AME church in Charleston, prays with the black worshipers who have welcomed him into his house, and before going, puts up a manifesto online saying, I hate black people. Hashtag KKK. Hashtag neo-Nazi. Hashtag Black men are going to come and take our white women. This is all on his manifesto. Yeah. What do we say? He was sick. He was poor. He was disturbed. He was a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. right? A lone wolf. The same thing for Aurora. The same thing for Oregon. The same thing for all of the mass shootings. When San Bernardino happens, what do we do? ISIS comes to America four days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. And the question that we ask is, what is it about Islam that makes people do this? How is Islam, and I quote, a culture of death? If you want to know what white privilege <coughs> looks like, it is precisely this. It is when brown people, Muslim people, commit acts of terrorism, and we assume that there's a community and a tradition that has led them to produce these acts. But when white people do it, we absolve any community or any tradition or any gun-obsessed culture from it, and we just collapse it to the actions of a lone wolf. That's where we are as a country. Is it about ISIS? We have a lot to be fearful about ISIS. Let us remember that the overwhelming majority of the victims of ISIS are also Muslims. Yeah. Here's the part that at some point we need to be able to speak to the Trumps and the Ben Carsons and the entire Republican side of the political spectrum. When they want to treat ISIS as the potential agents of terrorism, we have to be the ones to remind them of something called truth, which is people do not get up and leave their ancestral homeland because all of a sudden they don't like the land or the food or the culture anymore. Syria has become home to the largest refugee crisis in the world because the people of Syria are caught between a genocidal, egomaniac butcher named Bashar al-Assad on one hand and the dogs of hell that are ISIS on the other hand. These are not your future and potential terrorists, Mr. Trump. These are the victims of terrorism. 
and to doubly punish people who have already lost their lives, their loved ones, their family, their dignity, their home, their identity, by again treating them as agents of terrorism is an act of cruelty that I can't even begin to fathom. Here's partially another chart. Good evening. Here's basically what has happened since 9-11. Points of view that used to be marginal on the internet have now become mainstream because their pundits are provided a platform on channels like Fox. Their point of view is now written into state legislature banning something called Sharia. And we have congressional hearings in which congressmen from the state of New York, Peter King, want to talk about radicalization of Muslims when we've never had a conversation about radicalization of other communities. This is why we see animosity towards Muslims continuing to rise from 28%, from 48%. Uh, uh, all the way down to 28% now. These are places where we have had anti-mosque rallies and demonstrations across this country. It's like watching the chicken pox of bigotry. And look, I mean, this is where I live. It's not just a southern problem. It's everywhere. Everywhere in this country. And if you want to know what it looks like, I'll come back yeah. to this in a second. This is what it, these rallies look like. Armed militias with AK-47s demonstrating in front of Friday worshipers. They're hoping for one person to lose their temper, and you can imagine the bloodbath that will follow. There's a gendered element to this also. The people who are most targeted under this new kind of Islamophobia are women. Muslim women who choose to cover their hair. So here's an actual one of these open carry rallies with a masked AK-47 carrying gunman walking behind an African-American hijabi woman. If you go to the Southern Poverty Law Center, this is the map of hatred in America. 892 active hate organizations, the overwhelming majority of them Neo-Nazi, KKK, neo aryan groups. Many of them with an obsession with guns. 300 million people in this country, 300 million guns. That's where we are as a nation. In the meantime, what are we not talking about? The creation of the largest refugee crisis since World War II. The previous largest refugee population were, of course, the Palestinians, four million and ongoing, permanently dispossessed since 1948. Over the last five years, we've seen a larger human rights catastrophe, the Syrian crisis, six million people being made refugees and internally displaced. This refugee camp in Jordan is now the fifth or fourth largest city in Jordan. There is no Syria for them to go back to. Every now and then, we get a moment that breaks and interrupts our discussion. Many of us saw the story, the heartbreaking image of the Syrian father clutching to his baby girl. And those of us who are parents, we know what we would do. You know how we would risk everything just to save our, our babies. This story fortunately had a happy ending. They were actually resettled. If you want to measure the health of our society based on how we're treating the most marginalized, here's where we are. Six million Syrian refugees. We are having a discussion about whether to take in 10,000 of them. And mind you, it's not whether to take in 10,000 new refugees. It's whether 10,000 of the total refugees that we would take would come out of 
the Syrian population. Prayer time is 8.15, is that right? Okay. With your permission, I'm going to go right up until the prayer time. Right. Remember Martin's conversation about militarism. Here's where we are. We spend more on the military than the next 12 countries combined. If you and I go to our congressmen and say that we want good public housing, good public education for our babies, good care for the elderly, good mental institutions, we want to take care of the environment, in every case we're going to be told, sorry son, we can't afford it. Here's what we have spent on the wars of choice in Iraq and Afghanistan alone. Wars which have not made us any safer and have destroyed those two countries. 6,000 billion dollars. It also has a consequence for the fate of our American democratic experiment. Where does that $6,000 billion come from? That's our money. That's our tax money that we give to the military industrial complex. They go to destroy primarily brown people, Muslim people overseas. And now hundreds of millions of dollars of war grade military equipment is being recycled back into American inner cities. This is Ferguson. It could just as easily be Baltimore. It could be Oakland. It could be Staten Island. The police are now militarized. And think about the consequence of this. We are now in the process of using war-grade equipment that was designed to kill terrorists in Iraq and Afghanistan come in brown bodies, and we're using that equipment in our inner cities, which are primarily African American, brown, and poor whites. That's why sometimes when you take a look at the unrest in America, you have to really look long and hard to figure out which one is Gaza and which one is Ferguson. It's the same tear gas that is used in Egypt, Palestine, Ferguson, and it's all manufactured out of Pennsylvania. Over there is now coming home to over here. Our militarism abroad is actually eroding and hurting our democratic experiment here at home. So here's where we're going to start to dig our way out of the abyss of despair that I have plunged you into, there is hope. There is real hope. But it won't be cheap, and it won't come easy. For the first time, we're beginning to see the outlines of a model of solidarity that is based on acknowledging each other's pain, suffering, and therefore humanity. So here you have people from Gaza tweeting at people of Ferguson, saying, they're using tear gas on you. I know this is new for you. We've had the Israeli Defense Force tear gassing us for decades. Wash your eyes out with milk. It really helps. <laughs> You're seeing the labor workers from Wisconsin tweeting out at people from Cairo and vice versa. People that are not related to one another, ethnically, religiously, linguistically, nationalistically, they see me as being caught up in a mutual struggle. You're starting to hear more and more people who speak back, who speak truth to power. When Malala Yousafzai, that extraordinary, courageous, young Pakistani Nobel Peace Prize winner, is invited to the White House, they have a beautiful conversation with President Obama, Michelle Obama, and their two beautiful daughters. And the White House releases a press release talking about how much they talked about girls' education. Malala releases her own 
press statement saying, that's not all we talked about. We also talked about drones. And I told Mr. President that when you drone innocent civilians, it makes the job of people like me harder because it recruits people for the Taliban. That's something to embrace. The willingness to stand and speak out of principles, though your voice quakes and quivers. You're starting to see a mobilization and an organization. So when our tax dollars are used by the NYPD to do surveillance on Muslims, you're seeing Muslims join their hands with African Americans and Latinos and collectively resist stop and frisk policies. This is the point that Martin gets to at the end of his life. This is what he says in Riverside Church speech. He says, for a while, we all used to look out for our own interest. And we used to say, I can't go out there and help them, because if I go to help them, what will happen to me? But Martin gets to the point where he says, you've got to flip that question. The real question is, if I do not come to help you, what will happen to you? I can't be human until you are fully human. My redemption is caught up in yours. Either we all go up together or we all come down together. One way or another, our fates are caught up together. There is this hope in this new model of solidarity. This is my dear friend Linda Sarsour from New York, who's kind of an example of this. What I want to end with in the last three minutes before letting uh, those who are ready for prayer, is to give you a sense of what it is that as a Muslim, as a person of faith, gives shape and meaning to my own life. You can find equally powerful, resonant, and beautiful teachings in each one of your traditions, whatever that happens to be. The first one has to do with this issue of, we have spent so much time talking about the place of religion in our public space. Do we need more religion or less religion? My faith teaches me that the real question is what kind of religion? Is it a religion that is about my three favorite people being me, myself, and I? Or is it a religion that says you're going to measure our health by looking at the folks who are suffering at the moment. So you tend to them if you want to do right. It's the religion that says there is a path to God, but it goes through humanity. It's the religion that shows up in all of those beautiful medieval poetry books that some of us have had a chance to read for years. Two brothers have spent their life living a very different life. One of them just worships God. The other one spends his whole life taking care of his mother. The one who worships God every day and night has a dream in which he hears the voice of God coming and telling him, you've been saved. All your sins are forgiven for the sake of your brother. And he's like, God, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be redeemed. Surely you got us confused. You see, I am the good brother. I'm the worshiping brother. I'm the one who's praised you morning, noon, and night. My brother hasn't even done his prayers. And the voice of God comes back and says, No, my son, I never needed your prayer. Your mother was in need. Your mother deserved your compassion and your service. It's that reminder that the path to God does have to go through humanity. Let me end with these two short sayings. Both the tradition of Martin and the tradition of Islam leave us with this powerful recognition. 
In the Quran, it is, God commands you to love and justice. The realm of love and the realm of justice are intertwined with one another. The way that we put it in the American freedom tradition is the following. A lot of people talk about justice. All that we mean by justice is love when it comes into the public space. We know what we want for our babies. What justice means is that I know you want the same thing for your babies that you love that I would want for my babies that I love. When we want the same thing for each other, that's what we're going to call this love-suffused justice. I hear the call to prayer, so let me end with a short poem of that masterful, beautiful poet, the greatest mystic of Islam, one of the greatest lovers that this world has ever known, named Rumi. This is also my inspiration on how do we build a good human community. And it's simple, and it's my last words. Rumi leaves us with this message. He says, you and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. May we be capable of this, inshallah, willing to do the work and link together our struggle and our humanity and live as if we never heard of Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, we're going to, you, you all have uh, given us some really great questions. And we want to have the, uh, the chance to as, ask uh, Professor Safi as many of them as possible. Uh, the first question is, in a time when so many people believe that truth is relative and morals are self-generated, how do we change racism in the U.S.? <laughs> um, let me wrap my brain around that a little bit. At a time that we believe that truth is relative, and morals are self-generated, self how do we change Okay, um, I, I'm not entirely sure that I follow the connection from the A to the B, um, but maybe I can give that uh, the beginning of, of an attempt. Um, so, I live in the Deep South, and it's a part of the country with an atrocious legacy of slavery. Um, and in many ways, it's, many of the attitudes behind it are coming back with a theory of, in my own state of North Carolina, which at one point in time was kind of one of the success stories of the South. There's a whole move towards disenfranchising of younger voters, elderly voters, people who are physically unable to drive, for example, being prevented from voting. Um, Muslims banning same-sex unions, slashing public education, destroying the environment, and all of that. I'm surrounded by angry white people who feel that their way of life is deeply threatened. Um, they look around them and they see an America that they don't recognize. This is an America which is increasingly brown in terms of Hispanic, Muslim, South Asian immigration. It's an America where norms of sexuality, marriage, look very different than what they were perhaps raised with. And economically, they're hurting. Economically, they're weak. They're working their tails off, and they're not achieving the American dream. In a weird way, and this is the only thing they have in common, 
both Trump and Bernie are actually tapping into that. They're both echoing to people their sense of the system is broken for you. The difference is, where do we go from there? And on the Trump side of it, the answer is, your life isn't as good as you want it to be. It's the fault of those Muslims. It's the fault of those gays and lesbians. It's the fault of those Hispanics. It's the fault of African Americans. On the Bernie side, there's obviously a very different answer. So I actually do wholeheartedly embrace the notion that morality is not a one-size-fits-all model, um, that each one of us do experience our own reality, and as hippie and PC as it sounds, we actually do have our own truth. The question for me is, is there the recognition that no one of us has a monopoly on dignity? Is there an acknowledgement that the lives and the dignity of other people ma matters exactly, not an iota less and not an iota more than our own? And is there an acknowledgement that there is a greater we that we have to work towards? Um, so in one sense, I am an absolutist, but only in the sense that every single life is precious and sacred no exceptions, but the dignity, the worth, the value of every human life is absolutely detached from your wealth, from your sexual orientation, from your gender, your nationality, your ability, um, your religion. At that level, I am an absolutist, that every single life has that same innate value. On a practical lived level, um, I don't need for other people to believe the same thing that I do. I'm interested in saying, are they willing to form meaningful partnerships with me to achieve a good that's greater than any one of us? So maybe that's as good as. Okay, I think that, thank you very much. The, the, next, the next question continues in a similar vein. Um, I believe this is a student who's asking, how do we engage with supporters of Trump or other hateful people, uh, uh, people with hateful ideologies? So um, here's where there has to be, where self-care is real. Um, I'm 45 and a half. Okay. <laughs> Which means that if, inshallah, I'm given a very long life, I'm now in the autumn of my life. It means things like I get up in the morning and body parts hurt. Uh, it means that after I do this, I'm going to go to the hotel room and collapse. Whereas 10 years ago, if I had done this, I would have been like, let's find 10 people, go to a coffee shop, and stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning to plan the revolution. <laughs> right? Uh, I'm much more aware of the limits and the fact that actually I have access to the infinite love, compassion, wisdom, beauty of God, but I'm a very, very finite human being with limited time, limited energy, limited patience. 10 years ago, my inclination would have been to say, let me have the Trump supporters. I will reason with them. I will hit them over the head with facts. I will appeal to their humanity. I will appeal to their compassion. And in my heart of hearts, yeah, I'm still a teacher. I still believe that love is more divine than apathy. I still believe that knowledge is more luminous than ignorance. But I also know that I'm not going to go bang my head against the wall. And I've also learned that we make choices in life. And the real meaningful choice that I have to make is, where do I go to spend my time? Do I go to spend my time arguing with a Trump supporter? Or am I going to go talk to a Black Lives Matter organizer? and figure out how do we link our struggles together. 
am I going to go with the people in my hometown who are working for same-sex union to deal with the poor, undocumented immigrants? Am I going to talk about Muslims who are struggling against racism and homophobia and surveillance? I'm much more inclined to put my time into building the solidarity with the good than just banging my head against the wall. Uh, which isn't answering that question directly, but it's just a reminder of where I am in my own life and the choices that I'm more inclined to make now. Okay. We have another question from a student who says, I am a Muslim American, I am a student at UB, and I am wondering when my community, my neighbors, my peers will stop allowing themselves to be brainwashed by Fox and other negative media rhetoric. Kindly suggest ways they can be educated on Islam. The, again, I'm a master at not answering questions, but that's just because I don't know the answer to some questions, so I just answer the ones I know. Um, before we worry about educating other people, we have to educate ourselves. The truth of the matter is that when you come to college and you're 18 years old, you don't know everything. When you're 45 years old and you've been studying this stuff for you know, a few decades, I don't know everything. Before we can become these educating, illuminating missionaries, we actually have to invest in ourselves. And that takes time and it takes effort and it takes learning, and it takes the willingness to actually be able to say, to answer questions by saying, I don't know. But I have a sense of where to look for the answer. As far as educating our friends, again, this is not an answer, but it's the beginning of the conversation. If they're your friends, you actually invest in your friendship. Whether you like it or not, many of us are burdened with the fact that we are the first blank that many people have been friends with. I am mindful every day that I'm the first furry person most people are friends with. Like, I am furry at a level that frightens most people. Um, and it's okay, if we're real friends, Right? You see my humanity, I see yours. Um, and then it's a commitment to grow together. I might be the first Iranian, the first this, the first that. You might be the first Muslim, the first lesbian, the first Kashmiri, the first whatever that your friends are coming across. I think just to own your humanity, to make sure that that's never negotiable. <coughs> which is actually extraordinarily hard to do in a world that constantly wants to dehumanize you. You have to be your own first advocate. Like, I do not give you permission to speak to me in that way. It has to be a perfectly plausible answer. And the right answer is not the Fox answer, which is we're going to measure the veracity of our positions by looking at the volume of our voice. Now, I don't want to outshout you. I actually don't want to talk to you. Because until and unless you're willing to see me as not a saint and not a terrorist, but as a human. Until and unless you're willing to see that the line between good and bad doesn't divide nations, doesn't divide civilizations, doesn't divide religions. That's a messy line that goes through each one of us. I mean, Rumi, we can talk more about poetry now. Rumi, the great Rumi says, every single one of us is a jackass with wings of angels tacked on. That's us. Every single one of us has angelic qualities, divine qualities, and we all have our own inner asshole. Life is a process of becoming. Which qualities are going to manifest today? Friendship. Community is that sense of, will you be my partner in bringing out 
something that's beautiful. And the best of those friendships are the ones that you keep track of each other. I, I don't want you to become me. I hope you don't expect me to become you. But I do want you to become the kindest, the gentlest, the most informed, the most loving you that you can be. And help me become that. Hold me accountable for that. Um, do you think that the, the emergence of ISIS is related to the Sykes-Picot Agreement? I had a chat, actually, with the person who asked that question. For those of you who don't know, if so, how would you describe the Sykes-Picot Agreement is one of the low points in, um, uh, in European colonial intervention in the Middle East, where literally uh, arrogant French and British statesmen drew lines across the Middle East, declaring this a British colony, that a French colony, this a British zone of influence, that a French zone of influence, and the entire mess of 20th century and 21st century Middle Eastern history in places like Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Israel, most of all, goes back to that horrible, arrogant decision. One of the challenges that we have is we don't even have a language on how to talk about colonialism, and we don't have a language on how to talk about empire. Mm -hmm. The difference between the Brits and the Americans is that the Brits at least embraced being an empire. The British Empire, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Yes, we colonize India, and we colonize this, and this, and this, and this, right? We have been an empire for a long time. The difference is you go up to most Americans and you're like, psst, we're an empire. And they're like, oh, how dare you? We were the force of the good. They're like, well, you want good? Go talk to Native Americans. You want good? Talk about transatlantic slavery. Talk about the Philippines. Talk about Mexico. You want good? Okay, this is too serious. You want good? You want to know how arrogant we are as an empire? Look at Superman. Superman. Okay, think about the extent of cosmic arrogance. Where does Superman come from? Planet Krypton, which is where? Like, okay, but it was like on the other freaking side of the galaxy, okay? Now, Superman comes to the Earth to fight for three things. Truth, justice, and the American way. Give me a freaking break. <laughs> but he's, this is like arrogance of empire in a way that transcends a galaxy. People in far off galaxies want to come here to fight for the American way, right? You need therapy. <laughs> like if our children at no point raise their heads and say, Mommy, why would Superman come from another planet to fight for the American way? Right? If they never ask that question, then we all collectively need to go to therapy. Right? Okay, um, moving from Superman to ISIS. Um, do you uh, don't you think it is more appropriate to see ISIS as a world gang, young, angry, disenfranchised individuals who are turning to violence after feeling they have been shot, shut out of life dreams, and having more to do with lack of opportunity and rampant poverty rather than religion and culture? Shouldn't we be addressing um, creating opportunity for all rather than bombing people? Uh, anything other than bombing people, I'm probably going to be in favor of. Um, you know, as other people better than wiser and funnier than me have said, bombing people for peace is like screwing your way to virginity. Um, you're making, and look, every study that we have teaches you this. You bomb a society, and people there hate you. Muslims globally do not hate America. 
they're actually quite obsessed with our culture. Our music, our TV shows, our movies, American hip hop is the global idiom increasingly in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia. But what's the difference between a country like Indonesia, where America is beloved, and a country like Iraq and Afghanistan and Palestine, where we're almost universally hated, we bomb them. Right? It's not rocket science. You bomb the people, they don't like you. <laughs> the first part of that question, though, I think, we do know that there are thousands of people from North Africa, from Europe, and a very small number from North America who get up and volunteer to go to fight for ISIS. What motivates them? We have a glimmer of idea. Some of them are thrill seekers. Some of them are looking for adventure, for glory, for there's also a militaristic cult of masculinity that is about this. Others of them, when you ask them question, what made you want to go to ISIS, it breaks your heart. Because a lot of these were actually beautiful, idealistic young people. They say, I kept watching YouTube videos of people being butchered in Syria. I couldn't sit there and watch that happen to them. I wanted to do something. I thought I was going to fight Bashar al-Assad. I thought I was going to be a hero. And then they get there, and of course what's waiting for them is extraordinarily different. I was called in to the American State Department to advise them on how to fight ISIS. It didn't go well. But the informative part of the discussion was this. The Under Secretary of Public Affairs was sitting there, and the first thing he said is, we don't know how to beat ISIS, because we can't bomb them to oblivion. We've tried that. He said, we're being out-technologied by them. He said, ISIS sends out 80,000 tweets a day. He said, for us to send out one single tweet, it has to go through five committees. He said, the reason we're losing the PR war is that they're better at social media than we are. Right? If you want to understand ISIS, reading books on 10th century Islamic theology texts on martyrdom aren't going to help you as much as understanding post-colonial failed states, which have been decimated through both colonial intervention and autocratic local dictators, and then the way that groups like ISIS come and promise the stability and the order that neither the West nor their dictatorships have actually been able to deliver. And the last little thing, and ISIS can go to hell on their own, on the fast track, do not stop, go, do not collect 200. The other thing that I will say, this idea of the movement of young people across the world to go fight foreign wars is not as strange as we would think. There are thousands of American citizens who go to fight for the Israeli army. Bombing, maiming, and killing defenseless civilian populations in the thousands. We have an entirely different rubric for how to treat that. This is not a popular thing to say, but one of the ways that we have to reframe the discussion around terrorism, terrorism has to be seen as politically motivated attacks on a civilian population, period. Our current national discourse is terrorism is politically motivated attacks on a civilian population committed by non-state entities. In other words, if you're wearing the uniform of the American, the Israeli, the Pakistani, the Egyptian state, and you kill a defenseless civilian population, by definition, we don't consider that terrorism. We need to change that. We have to look at it through the eyes of the victim. 
for the victims on the ground, it doesn't matter the person dropping the bomb on them is ISIS or Assad, Hamas or Israel. The sanctity of that life has to be what we start with. You want to stay as long as you They can get up and leave. I'm not the kind of Muslim who holds hostages, you know. <laughs> Could you please comment on violent extremist groups such as ISIS use of religion to justify their actions? In view of your, your comments, how are they so misguided in their interpretations? Um, so the way that many people try to answer that question is to say there's this thing called true Islam, real Islam, and then these things are bastardizations of that. So I, I actually start out from a different point of view. I know my history in this country, and I know that the KKK claimed to be a Christian organization, and I know that Martin Luther King was a Christian. Right? I don't equate the two. But I recognize as a scholar of religion that religion amplifies what is in people's hearts. If you have goodness, beauty, love, religion makes you lovelier, kinder, gentler. And if your heart is filled with venom, the religious act that comes out of you is going to be a hateful, amplified act. So on one hand, I actually have no problem if people want to call ISIS Muslim terrorism. It is. It is terrorism committed by Muslims. The only place that I would draw the line would be to say that the Islamic tradition actually has norms. It actually, you can't put up something on a website and say, ta-da, it is now Islam. It's a 1,400-year tradition with its own scholarly, mystical, ethical, poetic traditions. Just like I can't issue a Supreme Court decision, because I'm not on the Supreme Court, as much as I would love to, right? I'm not on the court. I'm not qualified to do that. And some of the same applies to Islam. So by the standards of the Islamic tradition, the actions of ISIS do not qualify as legitimately Islamic. Everything that we know from the Prophet and the Quran and Islamic law specifically lists how one is to conduct oneself in warfare. Beheading people, burning people, mutilating bodies violates that. So the way that I try to answer it in the most truthful way is yes, it is Muslim terrorism. It's terrorism committed by Muslims, but don't pretend that it measures up to the standards of Islam. Given, given the inability of nations as empires to bring order and justice to the world, what prospects do you see for the creation of a world government based on the common principles of human rights and justice and social justice. Well, we got the truth and justice part, so we just need Superman, right? <laughs> then we can have the world government. Uh, and, and look, you know, the world government idea, that's just, it's a little creepy, because, you know, it can so easily be sounding like all kinds of uh, other authoritarian language, world conspiracies and all of that. Um, here's what I would say. We're either going to kill each other and destroy the one planet in the infinite galaxies that so far we have found to live on. That's where we're headed, right? You do nothing, a few hundred years from now, we're all gonna be underwater. Grow gills, people. <laughs> so either we're gonna, as Dr. King used to say, either we're gonna learn to live like brothers and sisters, or we're gonna perish like fools. <laughs> There's that part of it. The empires ran their course. The nation state model, frankly, I think is failing us. There are many of us who don't fit. Um, if somebody wants to have a nation state, more power to them, provided 
that each and every person inside the borders gets to have exactly and identically the same set of rights, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, ability, ethnicity, or religion. On that level, I think we could actually fix quite a lot of, of where we are. But we need to have our dreamers. We need to have the people who can actually dream of a better future and work to materialize it. We're not doomed to live this way. We're not meant to live this way. Every conflict that you see, take the most entrenched one, Palestine, Israel, India, Pakistan, whatever you want to think of. Every single one of them has an earthly, historical origin. None of these conflicts are written in heaven. They're not in your scriptures. They had a start in the early to middle 20th century, colonialism and nationalism. It has an earthly origin, it must have a just, peaceful, earthly resolution. I think to also insist on that, to insist on the fact that, no, these are not, to quote the worst book ever, an ancient and eternal enmity. These are 20th century wars, competition over land. We started it, we should be able to. Uh, I am black, Muslim, female. I feel privileged not to face discrimination. Is there a true definition of equality? And if so, can it be reached? Um, when Malcolm X comes back from Mecca and he lands in JFK, he is interviewed about what he wants to be called. And there's this beautiful title, El Hajj Malik al Shabazz. And the interviewing person says, you got this fancy new title, I thought you were Malcolm X. What do you want us to call you now? And his answer is, yes, I went to the African world, to the Muslim world, I was treated like a brother. When I'm there, I know what it's like to have that dignity. It's like, but I came home, and over here, I'm still going to be called Malcolm X, because it's not about me. It's actually about my community, and it's about the structures that produce violence. So as long as the structures remain in place, I'm gonna to continue to devote myself to it. So anybody who says, I have personally not faced racism, A, like, good on you. B, that changes nothing about the fact that we still live in a society that is hierarchical and produces violence at a systematic level against people based on a whole series of criteria. Until and unless that system is dismantled, none of us are free. None of us can experience full equality. But in the meantime, we can live lives of dignity. If Trump becomes president, how do you think it, it could actually affect Muslims? Um, I have a blog called um, something about the conversation around virtually every Muslim that I know, if they know that no one is listening, has had the conversation about if Trump becomes president, where are we going to move to? Mm -hmm. Where is the safety place? And it's a shrinking list now. Um, and I wrote that, and then at the end I said, but you know what? We're actually not going anywhere. This is home. This is where, this is where I got married. This is where my babies were born. This is where I want to see my grandchildren. And we can't let the terrorists win. So the only thing that's going to happen is that Muslims are going to become more informed, more organized, more vocal, bolder, more networked. Fundamentally, we have done nothing wrong. So our job is to hold up a mirror to the rest of America, 
but to work to link our struggles with other people. Someone is asking, can you recommend any Twitter hashtags or other social media channels for those wishing to join the conversation? I'd have to think about that one for a little bit. Um, I'm an old fart. Um, I like Facebook because I like words. Um, I don't think in 140 characters. I like epics of poetry where like the love unfolds in, you know, epochs. I don't, I can't do 140 characters. And then, you know, my daughter now informs me that like, now it's about Snapchat and Periscope and whatever the hell comes sort of after all of that. Um, so the learning curve, like you all, you who asked that question, you actually need to educate us. Um, what would be a good hashtag? Teach us. We can be taught, but we're a little slow. Uh, there's a learning curve kind of involved. Um, I am, I tell you, one of the things that gives me incredible hope, incredible hope, and as I've said uh, to other people today, my favorite, one of my favorite biblical lines is that we're all prisoners of hope. We might be in prison, but we're prisoners of hope, which is not the same thing as that cheap American quality of optimism. Right? It has nothing to do with the sun will rise tomorrow. No, it's like we're in prison. This sucks. This is awful. It's awful that my eight-year-old daughter asks me if she is safe walking around her neighborhood. It's awful. The thing that gives me hope in the middle of all that despair is everywhere that I go, I see extraordinary, bold, beautiful, talented young people who are rising up. And they're unbought, they're unintimidated, they're aware of their own humanity, and they know to link it to others. It comes natural to you. Giving a damn about your fellow human beings is somehow so much more evident to you than it was to people of my generation. Um, as long as we can keep you and save you from the Kardashians and the whatever hell is dragging your attention down and turn you towards the light side of the force, uh, then there's hope for all you Muslim Jedis out there. We have a couple of more thoughtful questions and then one really easy one. I'll, I'll give you the easy one. Does okay. your name Sapi mean anything? Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first one that has an answer. Um, must coalitions form, form out of suffering after violent rejection, threat of violence, or violent action? Read that one more time. Must coalitions form out of suffering after violent rejection, threat of violence, or violent action? Hmm. There's a whole lot of violence in there. Um, the violence is not theoretical. It's not that we have waited for a violent action. All of our communities have already experienced violence whether it's the internment of Japanese Americans, slavery, cultural genocide of Native Americans, the assaults that Muslims have gone through, the marginalization, the separation from their loved ones of Hispanics, assault on women's rights, same-sex rights, it goes on and on. We've already experienced violence. The question is how do we respond to it, how do we process it, and how do we link it? Okay, I may have to read this one twice too. Uh, it seems to me that we have many vehicles for our faith and love. That, that should be because what two roads are paved the same. Yet sometimes I feel the transport has us forget the passengers. So I wonder if we would be better off walking. It's a comment, maybe a question. Maybe there's a question in there too. 
One more. This is our last question. It seems to me that we have many vehicles for our faith and love, and that should be because what two roads are paved the same. Yet sometimes I feel the transport has us forget the passenger. So I wonder if we would be better off walking. I like the, the metaphor of being on a path. I mean, that's something that speaks to any of us who have heard about, read about, tried to practice in a small way the notion of any kind of a spiritual path, a mystical path. If the Jedi thing doesn't work for you, uh, if Matrix is more your cup of tea, you know, think of Morpheus, there's a difference between knowing the path and being on the path or walking the path. Um, walking the path and walking the path not alone, there's extraordinary beauty in it. Um, the destination language, the being on a vehicle, on a ship, and getting to the destination, that's alluring. Uh, I'm reminded of the fact that the last talk, and maybe we'll end right with this, uh, the last talk that Martin gives is on April 3rd, 1968, the night before he's killed, when he's in Memphis, because he's there to show his solidarity with sanitation workers. And the very last thing that he says is that he uses the promised land metaphor, which he's been very fond of his whole life, and it's the Moses analogy, right? I mean, you remember, he was often called the Moses of his people. Moses never made it to the promised land. The thing that he says is this reminder that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. I may not get there with you, right? But we, as a people, will get to it. And the promised land is not Palestine, Israel. It's not Zion. The promised land is dignity. The promised land is a life where we actually get to share that fellowship of humanity. To be on the path towards that is itself redemptive. I would love to think that in my lifetime I'll get to see it. Every bone in my body tells me that none of us will get to live long enough. But every time you have a fruit, somebody planted a tree knowing that they were going to live long enough to taste its fruit. Every time we struggle, in some ways it's for the sake of our as of yet unborn grandchildren. So we struggle for the sake of those who are not born, but we also struggle for our own humanity. And the walking, the journeying, is itself the way that I hope and I trust we redeem, we recover, and we insist on the dignity that each one of us is entitled to. Thank you very much. Let's give uh, Professor Safi a round of applause.